If you look at the, the, the active element of these Yagis, um, right near the, the, the poles here, you can see there's a loop. Um, at DC, that's zero ohms, effectively zero ohms. So we need to, to tweak it a little bit. And you can see on this antenna, um, there's a, a little filter hanging in line. Um, what that does is, um, because the filter is, uh, it, it has a passband over the entire uh, ISM spectrum. So, you know, as far as it's concerned, all of the RFID stuff just goes straight through it. But it presents effectively a capacitance to the reader, which is at DC. It's an open circuit. So you combine open circuit with the 10K resistor that we've got inside, and we've bypassed the antenna locks. We've given it its 10K DC impedance. So if you do this and, and you put it all together, um, you actually get a read range of 70 feet. So it, it conforms quite nicely with theory. Um, this is, um, I believe that in, in 2005, I think it was, when Flexilis set the, the, the RFID record at DEF CON, I believe they were using almost an identical reader, almost identical antennas. Um, my guess is that they fried their power amp and that they set their 69 feet by just connecting these antennas to this reader. Um, I'd, I'd love to talk to someone from Flexilis and confirm that, but that's my suspicion. Okay, so we can put antennas on. Um, what about amplifying the signal? We, need, we, we want more power. That's where the fun starts. So we could stick a power amp on this and, and you know, just bump the signal up, but we need to ID, and if, if we're going to be you know, operating under ham radio rules, we, we should be a, a little better behaved. It's very difficult to quantify if you can't see it on a spectrum analyzer. If you don't actually have any test equipment that can see the signal, how do you really mess with it? So yeah, you could just bump up the signal from a commercial reader, but you're going to be breaking FCC rules, and it's, it's kind of ugly. So instead, we go to the USRP, and that's uh, this black box here. This one. So, this is uh, it's a software radio device. Um, effectively, the, the computer does all the hard work of modulation and you know, figuring out what that signal needs to look like when it goes out over the radio. Dumps it all over USB. Um, the, the USRP up converts it to you know, whatever baseband frequency you specify and just sends it out on the wire. And then likewise, in reverse, it comes in, it's digitized, it's down converted and just dumped over USB, um, again, for the computer to decode it. So very powerful, very flexible. Um, and you can, you can use the one device for a, a lot of different things. So this top link is for a, a, a EPC Gen 2 reader for the, uh, the USRP. Um, one big advantage that it gives us straight off the bat is its fri fixed frequency. So. Um, we don't have to worry about frequency hopping. Um, we don't have to worry about you know, chasing it after with the fact and identifying. We know what frequency it's on. We can control what frequency it's on. The package also includes a Gen 2 sniffer. Um, so I was mentioning that these, these kill and lock codes you can, uh, you can retrieve remotely. If you have a USRP2 and you, you download this package, um, you can just sniff kill and lock codes um, and anything else that you want. Um, I would recommend, if anyone has a USRP, um, check out the clock tamer. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, GSM, as you might have heard, um, and I, I actually switch back and forth between 64 megahertz and 52 megahertz clocks on the USRP. Um, clock Tamer is, is by far the best USRP clock I've ever come across. So if you do, uh, if you do have a USRP and you do, you know, do some GSM work, uh, please check it out. So, okay, so we've got frequency control now. Um, we know what channel we're on. We've, we've you know, got stability over what frequency we're transmitting at. So we need a way to identify the station. Well, identifying in ham radio terms is, is really quite simple. It's, it's just a question of you know, Morse coding out a call sign every 10 minutes. Um, straight carrier wave, no modulation. You, you can modulate it if you want, but if you want to just treat it as you know, carrier wave, you're, you're perfectly fine doing so. I could have screwed with the, the, the USRP implementation and, and tried to hook Morse code into there, but to be honest, it was, it was too much effort, and there's a, an easier way to do it. Um, the easier way being having a second transmitter. If you've got a second transmitter that's tuned to exactly the same frequency, um, then when that second transmitter um, morses out a call sign, it'll just DOS the, the, the RFID signal. Um, so we need a, a second transmitter, preferably something that we can script easily. So we come to the IM me. Um, how many folks have one of these things or have hacked one of them? Oh, come on, people, you're missing out. So the whole point about these things, um, Travis Goodspeed um, um, put me onto these. 
They're, they're really quite nifty little devices. Obviously, you've got a, a keypad and LCD on there. You've got a very, very flexible radio. Uh, reasonable power output, works over a very wide frequency range. Um, C source code available, there's no firmware security. Um, they don't come as standard with SMA and JTAG ports. That was a, an aftermarket modification. Um, but yeah, if you've got a good fat, you get one of these things for 20 bucks, you've got one of the most flexible radios you'll, you'll ever need. So what we need to do is, is match the frequency and the power level to the USRP. Well, that's easy enough to do with a spectrum analyzer. Um, as it turns out, we need to amplify the signal from the IME just a little bit and attenuate the signal from the USRP quite a bit, mix them together, send them off to the power amp, and, and we're golden. So quick demo of, of what that looks like. Um, what I'm going to do here is... Okay, so I've just started the RFID reader. Turning on the power amp, have a bit. Um, so, what I have here is a little ham radio receiver that's tuned to the, the the frequency that I'm transmitting on. And if I turn the volume up here for a second, so that clicking, each click is a bunch of commands from the reader, um, telling the tags to wake up and activate and you know do their thing. So on top of that, um, if I push a button on the IM me, you'll hear the IM me. Um, morse out my call sign, and you should see the screen flash as well. Anyone managed to copy that? Oh, come on, someone must know Morse code. Ah, you're all useless. <laughs> anyway, suffice to say, it, it works. We can, we can identify the station. As long as we've got that thing turned on, it just, it just cranks out a call sign every eight minutes and, and, and we're legal, so it's all good. Um, let's turn this power amp off again. Okay, so we've taken care of the identification and, and we can now look at just scaling up the power level. So we're ham compliant, we've got an upper ceiling now of, of one and a half kilowatts, um, and, and you know, it's, it's just a question of what we can find now. So this is the, the, the power amplifier that I'm currently using. Um, this big box here is actually the power supply for it. Um, this thing will uh, deliver, it's rated at 70 watts, but if you really crank it up, um, it'll probably deliver 100 before it blows up. Um, cost me about 400 bucks. Not a tremendously expensive piece of equipment, considering the amount of power that you get out of it. Um, one thing about RF amplifiers, they don't tend to have volume knobs. So you control how much power you get out of it by restricting how much power you put into it. So in order to, to you know, increase my power level, um, I've got all kinds of attenuators here, and I just adjust the attenuation before I go into the power amp um, in order to you know, control how much comes out of it. Um, and as I said, we, we have to amplify the signal from the IM me, um, attenuate the signal from the USRP, bring it all down to the, the, the level that the power amp needs, and off we go. So an interesting artifact about range, uh, range reads, um, there's, uh, when the tags turn on, um, they require an initial burst of power in order to, to, to first switch on for the first time. And then once they're operating, they require lower power. So you can actually exploit this to figure out what the current limit is of your RFID read range in this case. Um, if you get your tag and you have to walk closer to the reader so it gets more power and more power and more power, and then it turns on. But then once it's turned on, you can walk back and 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 it turns off. Then at that point, you know that you're limited by power. You're limited by you know, the power that's available to the tag to switch on. So you can amplify your, your, your power output. If on the other hand, you get closer and it just picks up the signal and you get further away and it just loses it, then that's receiver sensitivity. So just by looking at whether there's any hysteresis on the read range, um, we can determine whether we're limited by the, the power coming out of the reader to the tag or whether the power coming back from the tag to the receiver. It's quite a neat little thing. Um, and, and it allows us to notch up our output power incrementally, notch up the receive gain incrementally, and, and just kind of keep track of the whole system. Um, quite a neat little artifact, quite handy. Um, a few limits on read range. Um, we've got 1,500 watts of, of RF power. Um, practical antenna limits, obviously, you know, you're not going to be carrying around an antenna the size of a building um, unless you're really keen. Um, so primary uh, sources of, of you know, limits on read range. Um, other ISM stations, obviously anyone else who's, who's transmitting on the same frequency is going to get in the way. 
Um, ultimately, the sensitivity of the receiver will play a, a, a limiting factor. Um, there's only so, so small a signal that you can amplify up into something that, that the USRP can actually make sense out of. Um, transmitter crosstalk, this is a big one. Um, and this is somewhat unique for this system as well. Um, we've actually got a transmitter and a receiver on exactly the same frequency. In radio, that's actually pretty... Um, that it, again, it swamps the signal from the tag and you, you lose the signal. Um, other things, ground interference, the, 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 the antennas aren't completely parallel beams. Some of it will be going down, bouncing off the ground and up at the tag. That scrambles things at the tag. And then when the signal comes off the tag, again, it's going to be bouncing some of it off the ground and back to the reader. So you've got all kinds of multipath effects, all kinds of distortion. Eventually, that's going to be a limit. Um, atmospheric effects as well. Um, the radar range equation doesn't really work in real life. Um, it, it, it's a good approximation, but you know the atmosphere attenuates things, and uh, that'll get in the way as well. And eventually, when we get up to really insane ranges, the curvature of the Earth is going to be a limit, because we're working with UHF here, and UHF does not bounce off, off the ionosphere. You can't reflect it around the Earth. So there's, there's a lot of eventual limits that we'll reach. Um, but in the meantime, let's, let's figure out you know, what we should be able to do with this system. Well, we're going from one watt of RF power in the commercial reader to 70 watts coming out of the power amplifier. That's an 18 decibel increase in power, um, which from the radar range equation, you get the square root of that as a range gain. We should see a 9 decibel increase in range. Um, from the antennas, we've gone from 6 decibels to 13 decibels over isotropic. So 7 dB increase gives us a 3.5 dB uh, range increase. So overall, we should see a 12.5 decibel um, increase in range. So comparing that to our 30, foot, 30 feet reference from the commercial reader, we should see a range of about 565 feet. What did we get? 217. Not what I was hoping for, but if you can see in the picture, uh, my wife in the, the distant background holding the tag, 217 feet is a long way to be reading an RFID tag from. So what happened? Why, why so little? Why, why didn't we get the full 565 feet? Well, as it turns out, um, that was with about 3 watts of RF power as, as measured on my meter. Uh, the meter wasn't entirely accurate, so it's, it's realistically more like about 10 watts. Um, increasing the power beyond that actually decreased the read range which is kind of counterintuitive until you look at the, uh, the picture. Um, this was, uh, I was using a, an, an empty lot by the Googleplex in Mountain View, um, as it turned out not so empty at the end of it. But anyway, <laughs> um, in the background, you can see the, the, the tent and the chain link fence. That's Shoreline Amphitheater. And that's a 10 foot high steel, rail, uh, steel chain link fence that runs all the way around it. Um, as I was increasing my power to, to you know, power the tags at higher distances, I was getting more and more reflection from that chain link fence. Clutter. So as I increased my, my output power, the signal coming back off that chain link fence increased and just swamped the tag. So clutter was the limit. However, if you work out the numbers on it and you, you do the number crunching, um, 10 watts of, of RF gives us 10 times the power, so 10 dB uh, uh, power gain, um, 7 dB from the antennas, if you, if you work it out, we're actually still consistent with the radar range equation. So we can swap out antennas and see a, a square root of the antenna gain from the radar range equation. If we increase power, um, again, we validated the radar range equation. So yeah, okay, we got 217 feet, but more importantly, we validated that these tags, the read range is dictated by the radar range equation. 
So if you actually, you know, do the math, it, it should still be able to, to, to do that. I'm, I'm trying to get access to, you know, all kinds of different places that would be nice.